Earlier this week, I saw the movie Luck. If you haven't heard of this film, I don't blame you. I think it's exclusive to Apple's streaming service, Apple TV. I have heard that it's also been released in select theaters, uh, but I haven't exactly found any, so don't quote me there. And the people who have seen this movie, they haven't been too kind to it. Yeah, this one's getting really panned. Rotten Tomatoes currently gives it a critic score of 48%. While audience ratings still have it at fresh, it's not too much better at only 69%, which is definitely interesting to me because I actually enjoyed the film. A good deal, actually. And I do want you to take that with a grain of salt as I say that. For starters, the last film that I watched was Rolf Breaks the Internet, which is less preferable than eating gopher dung. And the other main reason that you might want to take my opinion with a grain of salt is that I'm kind of desperate for animated content right now. I don't know how relevant this is to the actual review, but 2022 has been really barren for animation. More so than any other year that I've lived through. Besides luck, there have been like four other animated films that have been even close to relevant this year. Five if you want to count Encanto, which came out last year and television isn't doing much better. If you want to know why many animation channels have been taking a backseat this year or talking about other things entirely, this is largely the reason why. So Luck is battling against a pretty empty field, and it's still not doing well critically, which is usually a bad sign. But like I said, I liked it. I'm not putting it in my favorite movies of all time or anything, even though this might have to be on my favorite animated films of 2022 by default, but I really did enjoy this film. Three stories? It's a lot of dog poop research. I enjoyed most of this film, because I do think that this film is underrated, but the critics aren't particularly wrong when they talk about this film's problems. And this film does have a few glaring ones that we should probably address first before we get into the good stuff. The most notable problem with the film is its exposition. This is a problem that starts when they get to the Land of Luck, and it doesn't really stop until near the end of the movie. There is a lot of world building in this movie, and the movie keeps feeling the need to explain the subtle nuances of how all of it works. This children's movie, Pound for Pound, has about as much explaining as, like, a fantasy novel. And not all of it is important. Like, 50% of the exposition becomes irrelevant by the end of the film. For the target audience, I can imagine this being a major hindrance at points. Even as someone who likes world building, I was getting annoyed myself here and there. And this does come at the expense of some things that probably could have been explained more. Luck has two fantastical worlds, really. There's the land of good luck and the land of bad luck. We spend a good chunk of the movie in good luck, and that gets a ton of explanation and exposition. By the end of this film, you will feel like you've worked a desk job there for 20 years. However, bad luck is an area we spend far less time, and as such, its workings tend to be kind of vague. Its reason for existing is very vague as well. Even good luck isn't entirely immune to this, despite all of the explaining. It's populated by rabbits, which makes sense because of rabbit's feet. It's filled with cats, which also makes sense because of the lucky cat, which is referred to in the film. And it's headed by a luck dragon, which is a thing. But uh, I've never heard of pigs having anything to do with luck. Or goats being bad luck for that matter. Now, heavy amounts of world building is actually a flavor thing. A lot of people find it boring, but some people do fall in love with the lore that a series can provide. And I don't think that this is the most egregious example of expounding that I've ever come across. It's less forgivable considering the target audience. Kids are usually more into the story and the fantasy of it all rather than explaining how the engine works. But if you like world building, you'll probably really enjoy this movie. The problem that's harder to look past, though, is that all of the world building and exposition shoots the pacing heavily. The middle of the movie has a lot of slow moments, but the biggest problem is the ending. Light spoilers here, but this movie does have like a twist villain that gives up in like two minutes. It's a cliche that can't annoy me here because it's barely even there at all. A lot of the point of the movie is trying to explain why bad luck is important, but they never really manage to make it connect. They say that people can find good luck or good things in bad luck. You know, people meeting because of misfortunes, for example. But the actual moral of the film is a bit clunky. To put it simply, this is a film that just doesn't stick to landing. It has a particularly bad climax, which can be a major sticking point for some people. And I get why people don't like this film, and these are all reasons why you might not. It does have slower moments where the movie does take in its fantastical world, but at the same time, it's not like Luca, where the entire film is built around its slower pace. It's built much more like a typical kids animated film that stops to smell the roses. How much you like or dislike that aspect entirely depends on how much you like the fantasy world. And while I can't say it's the greatest, most imaginative world ever, this was one of the aspects of the film that I really did like. Luck is an aspect that's not usually explored in animated films. This feels like a lost Rise of the Guardians realm for St. Patrick's Day. Lots of green and gold, the place is populated by leprechauns, there's backing Celtic music. As far as like, a St. Patrick's Day film, it's nice to have an alternative to Luck of the Irish for once. Also, if you're wondering, no, I don't know why this movie wasn't released in March. 
I know I've been negative so far, but there's a lot to this movie that helped me look past its flaws. And what stuck with me the most was its characters. I love the main characters. Well, not so much Jerry, he's almost a non-presence. But everyone else had a really good show. The movie stars Sam, a girl who is cursed with abnormally bad luck. She's basically Milo Murphy, but far less optimistic about her lot in life. Which, uh, is why the premise works better here than it does in Milo Murphy's Law. It's the closest comparison, so I have to bring it up. Milo Murphy's Law never really worked for me because the premise was kind of wasted. Milo was always prepared for his bad luck to the point where nothing truly bad ever really did happen. So in a roundabout way, Milo's bad luck was almost a non-factor. Maybe the show used it better as it went on, it, it didn't grab me so I didn't stick with it for very long. But from what I've heard, it was a consistent problem throughout the entire show. Sam's bad luck makes her life a lot harder, which makes her an endearing character. In fact, her character type is something that we rarely see. Because of her bad luck, she is an orphan who has just turned 18 without getting adopted. Do you know how rare that is, especially in kids' media in general? When your story involves an orphan, it's almost like a rule that they're young and looking to get adopted, and almost certainly will by the time of the story's end. This movie stars a character who has lost out on that, and I cannot think of an example where I have ever seen this thing before. And while Sam does complain about her luck, she never comes across as a whiner. She does try to be resourceful, but her plans often do backfire. That is until she finds a magical coin that ends up giving her super good luck. Her first inclination with it is to give it to a younger friend at the orphanage so that she could get adopted, which is very sweet. And it plays very nicely with how much bad luck affects her. If Milo were to have found the coin, it wouldn't be so much of a sacrifice. If you're wondering though, the trailer makes Sam with the lucky coin look like a much bigger part of the movie than it actually is. She has it for like five minutes before she flushes it down the toilet. Also, if you're wondering, despite the movie having Sam go to the land of good luck and bad luck, we never do learn why she seems to be cursed with super bad luck. And while this could be considered a problem with the film, I'm actually mixed on this. It really is an open question with how the movie's world works. And throughout the entire movie, I was waiting for some kind of twist, especially with Sam being an orphan. Was she like, really a child of someone from this world? Or did anyone have special attention to her throughout her entire life? But we never really do get an answer to that. And while it leaves me with several questions, I think that any answer that would have been given would have been really predictable. Like, to even an average audience. Like, younger kids probably would have been okay with something like that, but I think that any kind of twist here would make just an average audience grown. So I think that they picked the less bad option when there wasn't a particularly good one available. The other main character is Bob, Bob the Cat. Ah, uh, yes, that is the first thing I thought of too. I love this guy. He's a sarcastic loner wise ass throughout the entire film and it came across as really fun. There isn't much to say about him altogether beyond that without spoilers, uh, but it really works. And that brings me to this movie's saving grace. What makes this movie work for me specifically is its humor. I found this movie incredibly funny. There were definitely jokes that didn't work. Every single movie is going to have them. Like, looking through bad luck, Sam has to go through the department of dog droppings, uh, which led to a few jokes that didn't work. But this movie does have quite the variety. Sam's bad luck often manifests itself in a lot of slapstick. She's often going to end up in a mess because of it, in some of the worst possible ways. One of my favorite scenes in the whole movie is when Sam is chasing down Bob after she loses the coin. This movie isn't like top tier animation, but it's constantly visually interesting. Especially as in the human world, Bob tries his best not to talk. It's all really quick paced and cool here. The movie has a lot of really weird jokes that I don't know how or why they work, but they really, really do for me. Like, Sam disguises herself as a leprechaun, and their explanation to everyone else as to why she is so much taller than everyone is because she's from Latvia. And it becomes a running gag, and I love it every single time it is mentioned. And I don't know why. They also give this unicorn a heavy German accent, and it's like just so out of nowhere that I love it. And while the movie does have an explanation problem with Bob giving a thousand of them, during these, Sam is often getting herself into some kind of accident or trouble. The jokes are more in the background, basically. And Bob being just himself really does work. His supervisor has it out for him, and their banter is never uninteresting. How's your day been so far? Okay, Bob, what are you up to? <laughs> Why can't a cat ask how his boss's day is going? Because it's weird, Bob. I don't want to go over every single joke, since the less you know about specific jokes, the better. But with its humor, I just found this to be a very funny, endearing film. I don't want to over-exaggerate. This movie is not Shrek 2 by any means, but as something that isn't from one of the big studios, it is one of the better animated comedies that I've come across. 
I am a bit divided on the score that I actually give the film though. The audience rating is probably the most accurate. 6 out of 10 when I'm not feeling it, 7 out of 10 when I am. And I know that this day and age, 6 out of 10 sounds like a bad lackluster ranking. But in my view, a 6 out of 10 movie or game or whatever is something that you can really get a lot out of, despite of its flaws. In my view, luck is much closer to a 7 out of 10 than a 6 out of 10. Maybe just missing the mark. Let me put it this way. If Ratatouille is like an a film, I'd say that luck is a C film. It's not Pixar, but it's better than most people trying to be Pixar. And I suppose that brings us to the movie's controversy. One of the people behind this film is John Lasseter, someone who was previously disgraced for what he did behind the scenes at Pixar. This is a big controversy that you can look up in your own time. I'd rather not bog down a simple review with the full story on this one. But I do think that it's important to at least mention this. However, I do want to stress when I say this, John Lasseter is one of the people. Movies have a staff of hundreds, if not thousands of people making them. And it would be a real shame if we took a negative look on all of their collective work because of the actions of one single person behind it. Lasseter was a producer, but the story was by the guys who wrote Kung Fu Panda. Speaking of that, this is the first film of Skydance and it really does feel like a first film. It's not a technological masterpiece or even a storytelling masterpiece, but it does have a charm and the makings of its own identity that the studio will probably figure out as it goes along. It's clunky like most first efforts are, and while this movie isn't as good as Toy Story, I liked it a hell of a lot more than I liked Ants. I guess the final question is, is this worth getting an Apple TV account for? I am not the person you should be asking that question. To me, if you ever ask me, should I get any streaming service ever, the answer is always no, no matter what is on it. I don't think a new streaming service is worth it if it had exclusive footage to the literal creation of the universe. Every new additional streaming service makes the world slightly worse, and it would be better off for both audience and creatives if we had like only three streaming services and no more ever. For example, I would easily buy this movie on Amazon or DVD, but I can't because it's locked to Apple TV. Hey, you've reached the end of the video. The names scrolling by right now are of all the wonderful patrons who donated to help keep this channel alive. If you'd like your name in the credits, head on over and make a donation yourself. Also, be sure to check out my Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for exclusive content and previews of my upcoming videos. I also got a forum where you can discuss anything that has to do with my content and connect with the rest of the community. To find anything that I mentioned, just visit my link tree in the description down below. Lastly, be sure to subscribe, comment, and share this video with your friends. Oh, and thanks for watching.